Are you an owner occupier, property buyer, or an investor buyer? And what's the cost of getting this wrong? Hi, I'm Sam Powell. And I'm Jared Krause, and we are the hosts of the Property Pals Australia podcast. And in this episode, we're going to be discussing what makes a good owner occupier location, mm -hmm. what makes a good invest location, and what you should and also should not sacrifice when going to buy either of those. There's some emotions that come into buying an owner occupier, but also emotions and ego when buying an investment as well that we touch on, which is very important to understand, and the opportunity costs of getting it wrong and what money you could be leaving on the table. Yeah, so we, we dive into how to choose an owner occupier location based on your, your future goals, and also how you can get the best of both worlds by being an owner occupier and also having a, a great investment at the um, at the time so bit of juicy uh, stuff there to, to listen in on and we also share some personal stories on growing up and and choosing property locations um, which I'm sure you'll get a lot out of yeah there's there's stories that are relevant to our lives but super relevant to you guys as well um, and you get to know a little bit more about our our weird upbringing <laughs> who, who we are as people yeah exactly uh yeah you guys gonna there's so much value in this pod you're gonna love it so let's just dive in welcome to property pals the podcast where we share everything around how to build a property portfolio from researching areas financing structuring buying selling and reinvesting to live a life of financial independence as a disclaimer, any information shared by myself, Jared, Sam, and the Property Pals team is strictly general and should not be taken as constituting professional advice. You should consider seeking independent legal, financial, and taxation advice from a qualified professional. Cool. So, tell me what you think. I think it's going to be cool to share this, like with with everybody. Yeah. Um, yeah. What oh. was what was going through your head when you're driving here today to do the pod? Oh, we're just having a bit of talk about this. Uh, it's funny. We've known each other for. God. I, I think it's 25 years. 25 years since not like 1998. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 1998. Yeah. 1998. Yeah. Well, yeah. 25 years. And initially, um, we used to go surfing. And I used to. Um, we didn't have mobile phones, I don't think, back then. Oh, no, not in 1998. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think my dad did. I think he had like a brick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you had those ones. But um, yeah. we used to call each other and say, oh, I'll meet you at the top of this street to go surfing. And uh, now I'm texting you saying, you know, I'm on my way to your place to uh, record this pod. And how different life has been over <laughs> the past 25 years, going from all the adventures of surfing and now we're exploring the uh the podcast adventure together it's crazy what you can achieve with i guess good relationships yeah i remember riding my mongoose push bike to the beach in winter to meet you at the top of the gold coast highway or the top of christine avenue that oh. meets the gold coast highway at that set of lights there and and wearing socks on my hands and my feet because it was so cold but thinking about it as the Gold Coast, it's like people listen to this in Melbourne and oh. they'll be like, you are such a wuss. Like, yeah. And yeah, true, I am. I'm a massive wuss in the cold. Um, yeah, me too, actually. Mm. I'm not a big fan of cold, but obviously we, we love the, the temperature here, so it's good. But it, it was cold. It was cold. I remember your, I still remember your phone number off by heart. Double five seven six zero seven five nine five five two zero eight four six eight. Nah. No. Two zero two five one eight. 202, oh geez, that's mine, yeah. Well, All you're right. You've got a better memory than I do. Yeah. <laughs> I think Joel's was, uh, so we've got another mate, Joel. Three, five, five. Yeah, and then I remember Justin's as well. Oh, Jared's dad used to answer the landline. <laughs> five, five, two, oh, eight. <laughs> two, oh, two, seven. Two, oh, two, four, six, eight, one. Yeah, yeah. So still the number. And I, like, that's how he answered the phone. Like, mate, I dialed the number, obviously, but he's obviously had so many um, cold calls from telemarketers at that stage he's just pissed off what's one of your I remember dad used to pick us up we'll pick all you guys up in the, so dad would wake up soon, wake us up in the morning on Saturdays and wake my brother Jake and myself up put us into the back of the car with our surfboards and then he'd go pick you he'd go pick up Sam and Jake Lennon yeah. uh, like around the corner and then you and then we'd go surf like North Burley for like a couple of hours, couple of hours. Yeah, it was good times. Do you remember the music you used to play in the car? Uh, what's his <laughs> name? Um, 
Oh, it's not that big. Is it not big? No. What's his name? He used to play 50 Cent. Yeah, I don't have to descend, but what, was, like, what was the classic one? Like, the more, BB King. BB King. Yeah. Don't you know you're right and we're the king. <laughs> yeah. And we're just cruising thinking we're killing it. <laughs> oh, that's oh. so good. It was good times. <laughs> All right, we better, we better dive into this. Um, if you guys love our stories, let us know because we've got so many 25 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you really don't want to hear it. Yeah, then we should share some like crazy ones actually. Maybe not. Maybe that's being a bit too vulnerable. Maybe you're jumping into the bush and cutting your foot open. Oh, mm. yeah, that was not good. Yeah, and man. then, and then, I was I was pretty drunk, right? And then, mum, he wasn't he wasn't ten at this stage either. I was yeah. What well, I must have been like eighteen or yeah. something. And we then stupid things. That yeah, um, Snowy, one of our mates, called mum and came to the hospital, picked me up, and was going to take me home. And I was like, Nah, mum, I'm good. I'm good. Like, take me back to the party. And I went back to your place. Yeah. And little does mum know until she listens to this. <laughs> we got we started partying again, drinking. Yeah, and you actually had the uh, the pharmaceutical drugs inside. Yeah, you, so you had yeah. Good time. I was flying. Yeah. Anyway, off topic, but off still, topic. It's, yeah. Uh, good to know who we are. I think. Yeah, I think it's good to just keep raw and real. Yeah, <laughs> give people a bit of insight of like we're enjoying this because we're mates, not just let's just jump in front of the microphone and camera and just talk property for the sake of property. Like we enjoy property. We enjoy each other's company. Mm. Um, except for that one time in Mexico that we had to have a bit of a break from each other. Yeah. Well, hey, <laughs> yeah, I'm married now, man. It's like, it's hard to spend consistently all your time with one person. It is. It is. Yeah. Um, we'll tell you the Mexico story another time, I guess. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Stay, Stay tuned. Stay tuned. <laughs> On the edge of your seat, I reckon. Yeah. <laughs> so the difference between an owner-occupier um, locations and investor locations. Yes. Now, I think there's going to be some important... I've got a lot of... As this conversation goes on, I've got a lot of things that I want to share around being an owner-occupier and the emotions involved with it versus the emotions involved with investing and how to separate them and then how to lean into the emotions as well because sometimes people think oh being emotional is not good I, I love emotions like i'm all about being a very emotional being um i think it's it's hugely satisfying if you understand how to how to use those emotions in the right way so mm. yeah well the world does sort of especially from a male point of view uh, a lot of males Get not taught, but it's like a societal conditioning. Yeah, to yeah. You know, suppress your emotions. Yeah, um, and that toughen lead. up. Don't cry. You'll be right. Yeah, stop being a wuss. Yeah, I used to get that a lot. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it does sort of consciously. Yeah, it obviously you see all the big, just another sort of rant. But there's a lot mm. of um, you know depression in all societies, and um, suicide rates are increasing. So it's something. That's topical. We're not just here to talk about property. It's all mm. about you know lifestyle and balance. And, that's exactly right. And health too. So, yeah, and emotional health is probably one of the most important healths because that that can that actually I feel underlies physical health because the emotions can create um, you to be unwell physically. Yes, because emotions can be stored in the body, and also you can be emotionally eat and stuff like that we're not psychologists so we probably should go into it but, I, uh, but have, I, a, have a look into it you never yeah. know what you're what you can learn and you're not alone either so it's yeah yeah good little message to share with people exactly exactly so what is the difference between owner occupier location best locations like if i guess let's talk about owner occupier first mm -hmm. um and what should somebody be like why would somebody what would they be looking for when we're looking at, you know, buying based on owning? Like, yeah, well, it's pretty it's common sense. Put my common sense hat on. Hello, common sense hat. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's lifestyle, right? And everyone's different. So some people like the beach. Some people like the rainforest. Some people want to be close to um, work, and mm -hmm. some people want to be as far away from a city as possible because it's just too many people. Um, there's too much going on and all mm -hmm. that. So. Um, owner occupier locations is, is to each their own, but often it just centers around yeah, that uh, the, the lifestyle drivers for that individual person and the amenities that are available. Yeah, and I think it's so important for people to really be realistic around what they want in a location. 
Like sometimes people will like, I want to be really close to public transport, but is the noise going to be an issue? If you're going to have children, like are you going to be on a busy street? Mm. Um, and also some people, I know when a lot of people move to the Gold Coast uh, and they have is they will buy in a location that they have done research on the internet and look at it sight unseen as an owner occupier come up and be like, oh, this suburb doesn't vibe with me, mm. you know. Yeah, they might have spent like one or two weeks on a holiday and mm. loved Palm Beach. And be in holiday mode, yeah. Yeah. And, when, and you hate Palm Beach. <laughs> <laughs> I, only, I don't hate it if everyone lives in Palm Beach. Like, it's a beautiful place in the world. It's just gone to a stage now where, like, we grew up and, um, you know, you can get a, a lot park quieter. And you, yeah. yeah. And that was where, like, we have that emotional affiliation towards, you know, a less populated location. Just like I imagine people in Sydney who grew up in Sydney and now are living in Sydney going, this is just insane. I can't even buy a house with a car park in it. Yeah, <laughs> you know? like, that's I'm, wild. You told me that last week, right? People yeah. are buying units for, what, a couple of mil? Oh, houses for a couple of mil. Yeah. yeah well, houses without parking. Yeah. It's, um, <laughs> but, I mean... That's just the way that we're, we're shifting. If you go into a more like a global look, you look into Japan, um, China, even uh, parts of America, like they're, they're just so highly densely populated that um, cars aren't needed because their public infrastructure has been a main focus for the governments. And that's obviously what's happening here uh, with obviously the light rail being pushed through, mm. heavy rail. And uh, when they're building, so what they're doing at the moment, which is very common throughout the world, they build... Um, units and they're selling units a lot of them are two bed two bath one car or three bed two bath one car and what that's doing is only giving people that limitation to own one car um, alternatively they can have two but it has to be parked on the street where do you park it and that's what we're seeing here you have to park you know a kilometer away and then you got to walk <laughs> back to your house it could be rainy it could be cold you could be pissed off because you just works 12 hours and now you gotta, <laughs> you can't even park where you live. So It's such an important to think about with your lifestyle. Of like you just want to come home and, and relax and um, yeah, it, it's what other, so parking, I guess, is one thing to think about, like ease of access to amenities. What sort of amenities are we talking about? Like, Well, it goes back to your lifestyle. So yeah. if you've got kids, being access to school, if it is a, um, yeah, you, know, you want to send your kids to a public school because mm. it's obviously there's less school fees involved. Mm. And then being within that catchment area is important. And there are you know signs that lead to good quality school catchments can lead to increase in demand in that um, location. Uh, it's not a one trick pony though. There's many factors to consider. It's not just schools, but going down that path to go, well, what is that person actually looking for? Yeah, um, and then you go into well, now you have found that location. You know, what are those best streets in that location? Um, and we'll sort of we'll, we'll cross reference between the investors. Oh, that's later. so good. But to think about, because I'm thinking about when we moved up from Victoria, I was about ten, and we moved in with my grandparents for like I don't know six months. And mum and dad looked at different suburbs, and they looked at the suburbs based on the schools, uh, and then also looked at the streets based on how close they were to the school and then how quiet they were in their last pod. One of our last pods, you were talking about a cul-de-sac. Yeah. You lived in a cul-de-sac. I lived in a cul-de-sac and the cul-de-sac that we lived in was so damn awesome because there were a lot of kids in the street. And then also we could walk to school and it was probably like a, a 600 meter walk. Not and like it, yeah. And it was not like just down one road. You go down a few to like, back alleys and streets and it was like it's sort of kind of safe yeah it was very safe because you would walk from the main road where the school was into a cul-de-sac and then you go through the other end of another cul-de-sac into ours um yeah it was quite a quite a good street but mum and dad actually like we stayed with their grandparents for a, a long time before they found that location rather than just let's just buy something because we found mm -hmm. out burley was like a really good suburb and it's where we want to live. I think also sacrifice is a good thing too. Thinking about dad moving up from Melbourne, he was running the office. Uh, actually, dad was a property developer. Yeah, no, we, we haven't, haven't, we haven't talked on, on this. And that's why he, he was good at picking where to live and obviously yeah. I've done quite well out of that. Yeah, so he was running the, the, the Queensland area in Brisbane for the property development firm he was working for. And um, 
he decided, no, we're going to live. We're not going to live in Brisbane. We're going to live on the Gold Coast. So he sacrificed the commute and time in the car um, to live on the Gold Coast for us kids. And I think it was an amazing sacrifice. Dad's super grateful. Thank you. Um, so I think that's a, yeah, <laughs> he'll be listening. Five five two two seven seven zero eight. Yeah. <laughs> so we, I think that's a good thing, right? It's thinking about. What can you, what, what's super important to you and what sacrifices should you make as an own occupier to be able to have that for, for yourself, for me, I don't know if I'm going to have a family or if you do have a family, what, you know, what, um, yeah. what sacrifices, I mean, what sacrifices you'd make a lot of sacrifices to your children, I'm sure. Yeah. 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 Well, we, um, also moved out to a bigger house to fit in all the, all the way. My children in. <laughs> my wife wants a third, and I'm, oh. happy, I'm happy on two. But let's, let's see how this goes. This evolves. We'll keep you posted. We're cutting it. We're cutting it short here, Kayla. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I used to have a. I still have it. Actually, a nice duplex, uh, three hundred meters from the beach in Kira. So oh, it's awesome. Beautiful place. Like great lifestyle and everything. But um, yeah, just as we grow, it, it was just a logical thing to you know turn that into an investment, and then yeah. You can, um, Get a, a house a little bit further out, but only ten minutes from the beach. It's just um, that's not even a sacrifice, really, is it? Like, it's not really. Yeah, we're very lucky the um, position we're in. So let me ask then: Did you buy that that unit, that duplex in um, Kira or Coolangatta to live in, or did you buy it as investment property? Because oh. this will be, I think, this will be a good, good, sort good of question. case study for people. Yeah. So I, it was um, obviously one of my first purchases. So I um, always looked at it as an investment. Mm. Um, we bought it in like uh, 2019. So my mate and I, um, it's actually a development site. So we bought it, um, I bought the top, he bought the, the bottom. Mine was a three bedroom duplex, this was a two bedroom. But the site itself had a 21 storey height limit, medium density, it was north facing, 300 meters from the beach. And you know, if you're listening to this, and we got the site for nine hundred and ten thousand dollars, which, um, I mean, it's just it's, it's insane the way where it's gone. But you got the whole thing for nine hundred and ten. Yeah, both both uh, both buildings. Yeah. So well, mine was four hundred ninety four thousand dollars at the end of it after I negotiated. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I. I push back a little bit just with uh, building a pest report. So that's a little tip I, I try to help people with every now and then. Is, tell us, tell us, what's the tip? Um, you know, you get your building a pest report and there might be things that, you know, don't seem like a big deal to you. However, you can negotiate further with the building a pest report. So it might be that there could be a few thousand dollars worth in uh, potential fixes mm -hmm. in, in hours. Um, the there's the back stairs um, that are on a slight gradient, which was um, <laughs> you know, they, 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 I'm laughing at now. I don't, but it, it was my first purchase. I'm, you I'm know, more, if it's four grand, you know that's a couple of good surfboards. You it know? was, it was. So it was ended up being four grand off the um, total purchase price. It wasn't much, but it was seriously one question. Yeah, and they they agreed to it. And that saved us four thousand dollars just like within fifteen seconds. So my hourly rate that day was amazing. Yeah, and I did the same thing with my WA property. The building pest check came back, and there were some things in the, the cladding of the roof. And we gave I just gave the option to the owner that I was buying it from. Hey, if you want to fix this, um, and you pay for it now. And I would prefer you to do that, so you know you can go get quotes and you do it on your own dollar and terms, or I take this X amount off the sale price and I do it myself and I could have made a bit more money doing it that way, but it would have been a bit more hassle. Mm. And they were just like, yeah, we'll just get it sorted before um, settlement. So that's a really, really good tip. Mm. Um, so, okay, <clears throat> you bought that as an investor. Well, I bought it as an, an occupier and in Queensland, um, there was a, so People often come to me and asking, like, do I go own occupier first? Do I go investor? Mm. And it's always you got to look at the numbers. So, uh, for me, in that circumstance, it was um, the ta what was it the Sam Judy way gets waived for first home buyers. Um, it starts at, at that time anyway. Yeah. So yeah. it fully gets waived under five hundred thousand dollars in Queensland, and then a pro rise up to five hundred and fifty thousand. So I was hunting around to try and find something for five hundred. Um, 
and so is my mate. We're looking at you know sort of that whole development side play where we control the whole asset and then hold it for ten years and then develop it when mm-hmm. we're older. Mm-hmm. Um, and so in that circumstance, I was able to get into a really strong growth location based on the data that I was using at the time, and I uh, got that tax free um, or stamp duty waived. So that was at the time I think it was fifteen thousand dollars that I didn't have to pay because I'm a first home owner. But in the back of my mind, um, it was the investment play that was I was interested in because the plan was to move in, do it up for twelve months, mm-hmm. um, and then either live in it for either twelve to twenty four months. Ended up being twenty four months because you do all the work, you enjoy it, you love the place. Um, but then also with the the tax rulings in Australia, you get the um, capital gains tax free as a principal place of residence for six years until you buy or um, say that you're you're living in another principal place of residence. So mm-hmm. that can be a really interesting play for people if they are looking to um, they can buy and then if they want to go traveling for a couple of years or go live in a different location for a couple of years, you maintain that as your principal place of residence. So <coughs> um, if in six years you haven't bought another property, you declare that as your principal place of residence, you can sell that property and have no capital gains tax on it mm. and then you, you can set you up. And so if you were investing in it and you, you bought either another owner occupier and moved into that, um, that then automatically becomes your investment property. And if you were to sell it, um, then you can, you have to pay it's like capital gains tax on it. Yeah. So yeah. there's different ways of going about it. Mm. Um, that's the way I went about it. And um, also when you go move in, you can do it up. You can get evaluation when you move out. If you do go to another own occupier residence, then you can, that's your benchmark because you've moved out at that stage for another own occupier. But you've increased that value by renovating it throughout that you know, one to two years. Mm. Um, so you know, the uh, government will then look at that. You know, say if you were to sell it in the future, they'd look at, well, what was the value of it when it stopped being your principal place of residence and you only pay the capital gains tax on that balance. But um, I'm not an accountant. This is just all general stuff. Um, so Yeah, and check your, you know, your state and the legislation in your state for like, st- yeah. um, you know, stamp duties and, uh, you know, well, capital gains tax can be the same everywhere, but um, first homeowners grant and whatnot. Yeah. Um, so... I think it's a very interesting one. You got, you got your emotions and your investor um, hats both filled up in mm. that one acquisition. Um, and <clears throat> I don't know. I, I don't. I don't know. I don't know. It depends on everybody who's listening and what they're. What's super important to them. I think. I, I, as I get older, I see more value. I see a lot of value in leaning into what I love and what I'm emotional about in terms of living because I know that I'm going to be so grateful for where I live regardless of the price. If, I, I mean, there's, there's going to be a sliding scale, right? Say, so, so for example, if I want to rent somewhere um, or buy somewhere, it's going to be close to the beach and it's not going to be, sometimes it might not be the best financial decision, but it's going to make me feel absolutely amazing most days because I'll walk across the road from the beach. Like just the other day, I was like walking across the road from the beach. I'm like, damn, I live in a good spot, you know? Um, and I pay for it, right? Whereas I couldn't live somewhere else and pay less. Hmm. So I think that I, I'm i very grateful for, you know, leaning into like in investing in, where I want to live with my emotions and take that sacrifice financially. But also sometimes I think it could be good the other way around where you're like, all right, cool. We're having a family and we want to make sure they're in a good location, but we also want to make sure we can afford to give them the things they need and support them in the way they want and not go and try and buy like this lavish home and be in an amazing amount of debt that makes you feel like you're always trying to keep your head above water. Yeah, so it's just an it's an individual person, like it's their own decision, right? So yeah. um, this is just it's actually a big topic that everyone is always thinking whenever they they sell that that, pot, that deposit. Yeah, you know, they've spent pretty much their whole life up until that point saving the hundred or two hundred thousand dollars required to even put into a deposit. In mm. Sydney, you're probably looking at three hundred thousand, depends on uh, 
uh, what you're looking for. But even um, if you get to 100k, congrats! Like it's hard to, for a lot of people. It's hard to save 100k. It's really yeah, yeah, but it's rewarding when you sit there and you see it. But yeah. anyway, um, yeah. So you've got to just take into account what what really fills you up, as you say, like that emotional side of it. Um, mm. What I say to people is, you know, where are you in your life cycle at this point in time? Mm. Um, there's people that are single and they you know, they haven't met their future life partner. Yeah. They've got a lot of um, aspirations to go travel and do all that. Uh, and for people like that, it could be that uh, rent vesting is a, is a better option. You forgo those little benefits from the government up front. But what we're seeing now, especially in um, Queensland, that that tax, that stamp duty threshold of $550,000 doesn't get you much. Yeah. Um, whereas, you know, obviously a few years ago it did. Um, and that was sort of like on that cusp there. And then in Sydney, it's obviously different too. They've gone up to $1.5 million now. Mm-hmm. And that sounds like a lot compared to here. Mm. But trust me, I, I buy property in Sydney and it's bloody hard to get anything. And there's such competition now. It's basically pushed that barrier from those who are playing in that one to $1.5 million range. There's just so much competition. So prices have actually increased dramatically just through that little range. Because all the first homeowners are trying to get in there, and they just want to you know, get on the ladder. The yeah, ladder. get get in the game. Yeah, so <clears throat> sacrificing some things financially to, uh, and, and also sacrificing some things time wise, and in so many areas, I think can be good for an owner occupier. But then you move into the blend of what you did. Mm. is buying based on it being a good capital to return down in the future and also you got some lifestyle like for some really amazing lifestyle benefits as well mm. so i guess i guess everybody listening like i'm trying to like frame it in a way like work out what you want and work out what's more important for you first and then lean into trying to get more out of it through the investor side if you're going to buy in, in um, if you're going to buy as an owner occupier versus if you're going to buy just as an investor, like for me, I put my hand up as an investor. I'm like I don't care where I buy. Like I don't care if I buy like some fibro house in the middle of nowhere. I do. I don't want you spending too much on maintenance. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's right. That's right. So, but if it's going to be like this insane yield, right, and the maintenance is like okay, I've just factor that in part of my expenses, and maybe it's maybe it's worth it if I've got. Well, we'll have to look at a deal, mate. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, there's there's a big debate, and that's obviously the topic of this podcast is owner occupier or investor. So you're hitting on some really good points, and um, going into the investment type of property, yeah. you know, what makes a good investment uh, grade property? Uh, there's a lot, pretty much everything that you're looking for in an owner occupier, but you're also looking for you know good cash flow, mm. and, and we should all be looking for good capital growth. So. Um, when you are, and that's kind of like the spoiler alert for like the end of this podcast was just, you should always be looking for owner occupier locations, whether you want to be an owner occupier or investor, because the owner occupiers are the ones that drive the emotional ticket price whenever you choose to sell it. Yes. Yes. Correct. Yeah. So looking at, and, and, and how many, what percentage of Australians the purchasing property are owner occupiers? Majority. Good question. But (coughs) Um, and knowing that it's a majority is like that's what you want to buy for yeah. because and it's not just the purchaser of when you sell it but it's also the owner like the person who wants to rent there they want to rent there because it's where they want to live Yeah, and even yeah. if you're owner occupying like there's all, there's suburbs within every local government area so we're on the Gold Coast here if, if you were like well I want to live in the Gold Coast that's when I go down to the data side and go well based on that where are the which suburbs within the Gold Coast are showing good signs of short-term growth? Because mm. then you're going to position yourself in a better way where if you buy into that suburb, which it might not be you know, your primary suburb like Burley or Palm Beach or something like that, mm. but it might be just on the outskirts where you're getting the best of both worlds, but your capital growth chances are going to amplify because you're, you're in that next wave of price growth. There's mm. obviously the ripple effect that happens and we talked about this in previous podcasts, but you know, a location gets really uh, a lot of high interest, very hot. And then you will see, like say, um, classic example, Burley Heads um, on the Gold Coast. It's just a beautiful lifestyle and over the past few years has been booming. 
before all the COVID and everything. And then the ripple effect from that was it got too expensive for most people. So they looked for the next best location. And then it was Palm Beach, yeah. which is next door to it. Same sort of lifestyle amenities, just didn't have the, the headland essentially. Mm-hmm. So Burley will always be the primary, but uh, what it basically does is people's mindset goes to, well, I've got $1.5 million to play with. I need a house. I want a house. I can't afford Burley. I can afford Palm Beach. Mermaid Beach, Miami, Noise Beach. Yeah. And you've seen it just ripple out that way. So um, when I'm looking at it, even for unoccupiers, I'm like, well, you know, where is that best next growth location? Yeah. And um, yeah. and I think it's good for that owner occupier knowing that best growth location, not just for um, the finance of like um, you're going to get capital growth and if you do rent it out in the future yield uh but also it's the living conditions get better like palm beach just gets better and better and better um <laughs> in, in terms of amenities though. in terms yeah. of amenities not in terms of parking for me yeah. with a push bike and stuff it's yeah yeah because now you can walk down to like really great cafes you got really yeah. great restaurants and then um you know it, and that's the also thing too so you go to sydney Yes, they don't have parking you know, really available, but it's because they don't need to. People love that lifestyle mm-hmm. when they go and they live in those you know, old school you know, terrace homes and they've got a lot of character. Yeah. And all they need to do is walk out their front door, walk to the bus stop, and then that bus takes them to work. You know, I understand that because getting in a car every day, is a, you know, it can be a pain. Imagine, I think it would be, I don't know, public transport has a, um, a bit of a stigma, stigma. around like, people being just on their phone looking down, probably not being the happiest. But imagine if you lived in an area where there was a lot of character and you jumped on the bus every morning and you were just hanging out with your mates on the way to work. That would be really cool. Yeah, well, you know, yeah. <laughs> and you don't get you know stuck in traffic and they've got all the bus lanes. But So then you've got the opposite side, right? You've got buy, as, buy with both hats on like an owner occupier understanding if you were to live there as an owner occupier or what the demographic of the person that wants to live there is wanting in that type of property and then also look at the financial side of like is it's got good capital growth and will it, will it have good yield uh, but then a lot of people become biased on the proximity of where they buy if they're just going for an investment they become bias towards where they buy because sometimes they have this thing of like i want to be able to inspect it or i want to be able to drive past it mm. what's your thoughts on that because i feel like a lot of people could be squashing their potential yeah yeah in oh. terms of capital growth and finances just based on the feelings of emotionally feeling safe because they're in their comfort zone so comfort zone can be you know can be good to lean into it at times but i think also jumping out of it and understanding the balance between it yeah uh, another key point just on that uh, owner occupier location uh, where, where you're going to choose just before we jump into it mm. is i know it's hard to plan for the future uh, but i mean you you can kind of step your life out and go well where i'm going to be in one year three years five years ten years and um or where would you want to be yeah where would you want to be yeah and it having that sort of deep conversation with yourself or your partner um, is really important when you're deciding which path. Do you want to be a rent investor or do you want to be an owner occupier? Mm, yeah, um, it's such a good so, topic to just bring up. Yeah, definitely spend a bit of time and just think about it uh, because uh, I did some calculations before we started the pod. So if you're looking at a million dollar purchase, uh, as an in- investor, you're spending $38,000 in Queensland on just stamp duty. As an owner occupier, there's a discount, so you only pay $30,000. Yeah, so, you know, say that grand. Woo! Yeah. But uh, my whole point on this is if you buy somewhere that you end up selling, the transaction costs are pretty high. So even if you were to buy um, a million dollar property, your $38,000 or $30,000 for like out of pocket for the stamp duty, plus your legals, um, call that a couple of grand, and transfer costs another couple of grand. Mm. And then if you were to sell it, say on a 2.5% commission rate to the sales agent, that's like $25,000. Yep. So you can see it quickly runs to about $60,000, $65,000, even take into account, like you gotta get a removalist, move all your stuff in, buy all your stuff. Like it is an expensive transaction and that's why, yeah. you know, you take that time to think about it. Yeah. Um, because if you buy and sell, even in the same market, um, it doesn't go anywhere. Like there's the risk of 
know, it could go back, it could go up as well, but mm. it's a very expensive mistake in life that's going to set you back financially. So I think the same thing. This is why I don't like flipping. Mm, uh, a lot of people love flipping and same with like in my space, flipping businesses. I tell people to buy and hold for the long term and um, that's what I do in both both arenas. Just mm. because the in entry and exit costs, when you do that multiple times, the compounding of those costs just go through the roof, right? Like even in just one, like if you're talking about like 60, 70 grand to buy and sell and you do that, what? You do that two times because you don't like the the first location, it's 150, 140 grand. Yeah, it's not cheap. So yeah. have a think about it. But yeah, going back to your question um, initially, which was, yeah, do you like people do get that confirmation bias in the location they did because they love it so much? Or or what about that they think they know the market better <laughs> there than anywhere else? Yeah, well there's a lot of information out there at the moment. Yeah. And that's also the issue is that there's too much of people getting stuck in, you know, like either analysis paralysis or like confirmation bias with um so a lot of algorithms now with social media, they uh tr like program to put what you're interested in or what you're thinking in front of you yeah so a lot of people do get caught up in that there's a lot of strategy that i work with with things like that so if you do have an owner occupier in you know, your location where is it best to invest it might be that your backyard is good what do you mean by if you have an owner occupier in your location what does well, that mean so if you if you own a property in yeah. say the gold coast yeah and you're now sitting there going, well, I've got you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars in equity in my portfolio and I'm looking to invest because I know that if I don't invest in my future, then I will be where I am today. And it's better to make your money work for you so you mm -hmm. don't have to work for your money. Mm -hmm. So it's smart mindset going into that point. Um, but then they get confused because they are not, they're like, it's not common to invest in locations outside of where people live because there's that trust factor where they, they want to be able to drive past it, they want to see it, they want to know the trades, people to go in and out of it. Um, and what that could be an issue is that if you've got um, all your eggs in that, say, Gold Coast basket, mm. there's markets within markets all around Australia. So at the moment, um, Sydney has been taking a bit of a bath um, and Melbourne like has also taken you know, a bit of a bath. And by that, I mean they've reduced their... The median house prices come back you know, around 5%, 10%. Whereas Adelaide, as an example, has gone up 13% for the last 12 months. You're going to be happy about that. You're happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that was that, like, people don't know the, the data analytics side of buying property. And um, there's you know, the demographics of where populations are going. And everything is, you know, we've got that history to lean back on and yeah. to understand to help yeah. us position ourselves in a better light. Mm -hmm. um, and... You know, so sort of based on that, people might be going, well, I've got $200,000 in deposit. And if I leverage that out, I could probably even afford a $600,000 investment property. Mm. Where do I go? And like, oh, I want to be able to control it and see it and, you know, feel good about it. And also there's a lot of ego in this this space too where people are like, well, I want I want that unit on the beach. So you drive can... past it and be like, I own that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's my investment wow, property. That's a good point. Yeah. And for me, I'm like, well, that unit on the beach suffers concrete cancer. You've got lifts, you've got pools, you've got 150, 200 bucks a week just in body corporate <clears throat> expenses. Mm. And you've also got that unit complex being built next to you. So your supplies, supply risk is astronomically high. Your cash flow is rubbish, but your ego is filled. Yeah, so, good point. Yeah, that's where... I like to think, well, where is that money best spent? And that's the opportunity cost we spoke about. Yeah, yeah. Um, so with the difference between owner-occupier location and investor locations, we talked about, we've already talked about in the previous pods about data that you need to look for when you're investing. Mm. Is it the same data? Are we looking at what's, well, um, if not, what, what, what data do we look at differently? Yeah, same data. You just, okay. um, well, for, for me and the way I look at it, it's just instead of looking on a nationwide basis and going, where's the best um, local government area um, and then what are the best suburbs within that local government area, you've already got your local government area because you want to live in the Gold Coast. You've mm. made that decision. Mm. Um, so you're really just analysing, well, where are the top suburbs within that area to focus in on that, that fills my cup because um, you might not like the beach or you might not be that um, affiliated with living so close to the beach but you kind of want to be 
you know, a little bit further out. You want to have like my wife, you want chickens, you want, you know, all this Veggie stuff. garden. You want your husband to drive around on a lawn. Mow the lawns. Mow the lawns. <laughs> Do the weeding. Uh, actually, she's actually really good. She hey, loves. that's that's a turn on for a lot of women, mate. She loves that stuff too. Yeah. So, all power to her. I'm not the handiest person in the world. Or you you have become. Oh, handy bit of a trade. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I enjoy that too because it fills my cup in that I work with my head and my hand, like my fingers. and mm. So that side of creating things, I don't get that in my career. So, yeah. Have you, I was thinking about the other day, I was going for a bushwalk and um, she goes doing bushwalk but she had had boots on. I'm like, fuck, I wish I had my steel caps. Did I Did I give you my steel caps or did I give them to somebody else? Oh, you give me my, yeah. yeah, I think. They're pretty dead now though, hey. Fuck, mate, that's been years. <laughs> that was a long time ago. Yeah, I used to do project management for high-rise refurbishments just with like family run. Oh, that's business. right. It was your uncle? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was sort of, um, I was valuing but also <laughs> helping him out and learning that. Um, that craft, so I learned a lot about, especially concrete cancer, property and cancer. <laughs> yeah, concrete and what concrete cancer is, is it's basically the Rio within the concrete is rusting is, is metal, and um, yeah, over time, obviously the salt from the ocean it starts rusting, and what that does, um, it cracks all the concrete, the concrete falls away. It's mm. quite you know expensive to fix. So it's funny how oh, I just got this realization. It's funny how. I went into the building industry, and you could call it property. Um, it's at the start of my career, and you went the office route job, and then over your career, you moved out of the office and started learning more about the buildings and <laughs> stuff like that. I gave you my work boots as I came out of the industry and went leaning into like more of like an office type <laughs> role job as well. <laughs> Yeah, and then we're all here talking on the pod. Yeah. So you never know where life takes you, people. Exactly. And uh, the main thing is that you're always learning and just try to enjoy the ride because, shit, we're not guaranteed tomorrow either, right? Exactly. All right, well, let's finish up there. Thanks yeah. for listening. Oh, okay. should, we, should we make them subscribe? Like, should we dangle a carrot or something? Like, oh, people know. <laughs> they, they know these days. It's like, if you, if, you, if you think it's rubbish, let us know. Yeah. But if also, if you think it rubbish, it's rubbish, then don't listen. We don't mind. Yeah. It's and good. if you think it's good, let us know as well. Because, yeah. That's and, and what, yeah. And what do you like about the show? Ask us some questions. Hit, um, go to hello at propertypals.au. Yes. And, um, I'll dangle a carrot anyway because it's going to be so valuable for you guys. Bit of cheese, we, yeah, a bit of cheese. <laughs> nice. uh, get the um, increase how to increase your borrowing capacity because mm. that's going to help you. And I've learned a lot from you, and um, and how it's going to help you get a higher property value or property price. It'll property increase purchase, your, yeah, yeah, purchasing capacity, and um, that obviously helps you make smarter decisions. And and obviously keep uh, keep interested. We we got. A lot of uh, content coming out and also a couple of calculators that we'll put on the website so you can you know, run your figures as well. And Sick. as always, if you ever have any questions, like there's no such thing as a stupid question, so correct. reach out. Um, and often we're finding that people that are giving us these questions, that um, it's helping a lot of other people. Yeah, so, yeah it is. It is. Let's all grow together. It's and, not just on your mind. Everybody else wants to know about it, so bring yeah. it on. And that, with that said, See you on the next podcast. Thanks for your time. Cheers. Bye.